roundtable discussion. And this is going to be the industry roundtable. It will be moderated by T.S. Kelso, um, another person who has a, a long, long career um, in this field. And he is currently the operations manager for the Space Data Center, which screens over 750 satellites every day for potential conjunctions in Earth orbit. Anybody who's ever spent any time with TS knows he has his trusty Apple Watch, and every now and then it'll ping, and it's because something's going on. So, um, and, and it's a little disconcerting to realize, boy, for want of that watch. Anyway, um, he will introduce his panel, and again, it'll be um, more of an informal discussion, and I will let him take it from here. Thank you. Okay, is this, yeah, it's working, okay. So uh, we've got our panelists back there getting mic'd up, and so I'll do a brief introduction to what we're going to do today. So this is Industry Roundtable. We've got four esteemed colleagues that I'm honored to be uh, moderating the discussion with. But actually, we want you, the audience, to be the fifth member of the roundtable. So rather than give you all the PowerPoint briefings till your eyes glaze over, no, no offense to the people that did that yesterday, <laughs> But uh, we, want, we want to get a discussion going about space traffic management from an industry perspective. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a brief introduction for each person, give them an opportunity to elaborate on who they are, what they do for space traffic management, what their company is doing there. And then we'll have a couple of questions to kind of get the discussion rolling. And then I want to see, you know, the audience participating in that. So when we ask you know, the panelists, like, tell me, you know, how, what you're doing in these areas or what you think the challenges are or what you would do if you were king for a day kind of thing, that uh, if you have ideas or suggestions or questions, uh, we're encouraging you to participate by doing that. So without any further ado, we'll uh, start the process. I think we're still waiting for Bivik. And go ahead and sit uh, there, Tom. And um, we'll go ahead and start the process. I'm going to start with Chris. I don't have the details on your bio, but I've known Chris for quite a while. He's a pretty interesting guy if you don't know him already. But he's working in the uh, insurance industry. And you might think, why is an insurance guy here? Because just like any other business, we need insurance, and we need to motivate the participants in this activity that we're talking about, space traffic management, to do responsible things to protect the environment and to protect operations. So I'm going to let Chris go with that and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and what your company is doing sure. to advance what we're doing. Thanks, T.S. Is this on? Yeah, it is on. Um, motivation, you used the word motivate, and that's a, that's a very key point. And uh, uh, from George's talk just now, um, one of the, the big issues that I would love to see in this community is motivation. So I'm Chris Kunstadter. I'm the head of space for AXA XL, which is an insurance company, a uh, big uh, commercial insurance company. We, um, we do all lines of commercial insurance, everything from space to aviation to ships to trains to thoroughbred horses, art collections, buildings, what have you. So we're very involved in all types of commercial insurance. Um, we, uh, the, we have a small team. We have six people in three offices, uh, but we're one team. We have a team in New York, a team in London, and a team in Paris. We, our goal is to embrace risk. Most, many insurance companies look at new technologies, new risks, and they may shy away from them. I always encourage my team to embrace risk. That's what we're here for. We're here to take risk. We're here to take risk and be compensated for it, but, but we're here to take risk. So we see the risks in space. There's the risk of mechanical breakdown, uh, failure of a rocket or a satellite, what have you. The risk of collision, the risk of, um, of damage to third parties, what have you. But we really embrace risk. And that's really the, the key point that I want to make. And I want to encourage people to present us with risks that we can then find solutions for in the insurance, in the insurance world. We also innovate. We've come up with some interesting new insurance policies covering, for example, small sats to, to make it easier for small sat operators, manufacturers, launchers, and so on to be able to get into the business without going through many hurdles in the financial or insurance world. So we're, we're very keen on that. <clears throat> in terms of the business itself, we're the leaders in small sat and small launch vehicle insurance. We've insured well over 90% of all the small sats that have ever been insured for launch. 
uh, by far the market leader in that business. And, and we like that business. It's, it's important to, to encourage and to innovate and to uh, provide the, the uh, ability for investors to put money in, into an honestly a very risky business. So, Historically, 5% of all launches fail, and that's, that's just historical numbers, and you can't really uh, beat the numbers. Um, but we want to make sure that there's, there's uh, a way for organizations, for people to invest and to innovate in this business. So with that, that's all. All right. Thanks, Chris. And our next panelist is uh, Eric Stalmer. You heard from, if you were here yesterday, you heard from Eric on some of the stuff he's doing for the Commercial Space Flight Federation but uh, give you a chance to talk a little bit more about that and, and specifically on the topic of tra space traffic management. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, T.S. Um, thank you, Chris. I, just a plug for Chris and what he does. Um, last week, or two weeks ago, at our, our, our conference, a commercial uh, space transportation conference, Chris, uh, and I've seen the presentation two or three times before, and I love it every time I see it. It's, it's all the charts you could possibly imagine on risk, about launch, on where failures happen, how they investigate it. it it's really fascinating from an insurance perspective. And uh, yesterday, uh, someone on one of the panels were mentioning, you know, how about get an honest broker, you know, maybe the insurance industry to kind of evaluate what we are doing and everything like that. And I, and I thought that was a great idea and immediately thought of Chris and his presentation on what he does. And um, Chris and I serve on the, the Comstack, the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Council. And, and the insight that he brings, that unique insight, um, and as, as George said with, with the, the stone soup analogy, which I loved, um, it, it takes a lot of different players. And I, and I know a lot of people here are the technical players. And one of the things um, that I wanted to highlight is about getting the message out, getting the information out. Um, there's no shortage of... Um, technical data that, that we have, and, and as, as I listened to the, a lot of the presentations yesterday, you know, just so impressive, the advancements that we're seeing. But sometimes, and I don't say this in a disparaging way, we're, we're in an echo chamber that we're talking to ourselves about what the problem is. Um, and I think sometimes, what, what, I think what we need to do is to elevate that discussion on who has control um, over this problem, and as and again, and, and George's presentation was excellent on on the different uh, mechanisms that are in place, legislative, legislatively, and from the executive level. I think what we need to do as a community is get out there more and and explain the STM message. Who are the people that control the purse strings right now? It, it's Congress. Um, there's. 42 new members of Congress, that might not be right, but about 50 new members of Congress that probably know nothing at all about space traffic management and the implications of this. And they're going to be people that are going to be voting on, on the budgets that what, whether um, uh, Kevin O'Connell moves from, you know, the, the, the basement up to the, uh, the, the fifth floor, you know, that they're going to have a major impact on that. Because a lot of times, and this is kind of a cautionary tale, as upbeat as I am on the current administration and what they are doing for space, it is the current administration. It's a Republican administration, and it is a unique character who occupies the White House. And sometimes um, that message that they're sending um, might get blurred with all the other things. So just how, uh, if it just a little bit on, on the Space Force. The idea of the space, we can all debate the idea and the merits of the Space Force, but something needed to be done. Um, space is a contested area. Uh, there's a lot of nefarious characters out there. There's uh, the defense of commerce as we move forward, just, you know, like back into the, the uh, 18th century with the navies. Um, but the, the delivery and the message and maybe, maybe even the messenger that brought upon um, additional scrutiny that might not have been there. So... I think as, an or, as a group, I love the idea of what uh, Sandy is doing with uh, AIAA on this working group and getting that message out. I would strongly encourage you, and, and, and that is the message I'm going to take back, is uh, more education to some of the policymakers. Because academically, I think we're doing an excellent job. And, and from what I see, the collaboration uh, and some of the briefings I've got in here and offline, this idea of collaboration and working with others and bringing more of a... Uh, a, a team effort uh, to present these things and how we can demonstrate uh, what is needed. 
but if you don't get to the people that have control of the purse strings, you know, we're really, really limited. So um, I will, and I, again, I bored you with some of that yesterday, so I will yield the rest of my time to some of these subject matter experts. So. The rest of your time? Yes. The rest of your time, the rest of our time. Yeah. No, I, and actually, I want to thank Eric because you've been doing a great job trying to get the message out. And that's obviously an important part of what we're doing. So if we don't communicate the urgency and the solutions to the people that have to make the decisions on resources, it's not going to happen. And so that's, that's an important part of what we're doing. So uh, next up on our panel is Tom Kabansik. He's the uh, Vice President of Advanced Technology at L3. And he's been doing a lot of stuff both on the government side, but now getting more into commercial SSA and uh, space traffic management and those kinds of things. So I'll let you tell us a little bit more about what you do. Sure. Uh, thanks, TS. Uh, I, I come to this with a, a bit of a longer perspective. I, my first uh, experiences in SSA uh, had to do with being inside Cheyenne Mountain in the late 80s, early 90s, and <coughs> doing things like watching little blips on green screens, right? <coughs> In what we had then, uh, we referred to as the Space Defense Operations Center. We actually had one of those. Uh, and uh, we had people that, as they looked at those little blips on those screens, we, if they wanted to get more information, we would have to go and print something on a uh, high-speed, uh, high-accuracy printer and print it off and, uh, in the closet and rip it off and bring it in and look at what they saw on the paper because they couldn't yet see it on the screen because we didn't have the technologies deployed yet to, to, to do something as what we think is fundamental today is visualization. So, uh, and I think back then one of the technical projects we were working on was converting the software code to Fortran 77 based. Uh, uh, so if anyone knows what that means, uh, that was a big innovation for us. Um, so anyway, let's, let's fast forward. Uh, uh, Applied Defense Solutions, uh, which is our, our legacy company, was a, uh, an organization that this last year was acquired by L3. And um, Applied Defense was really all about doing the analysis and the operations in and around space systems. We did that for commercial companies like uh, GOI. We did it for several NASA missions, uh, lunar missions, and um, the deep space and, and orbital missions, and um, also um, in and around national space programs. <laughs> We, um, as, we were, as we were doing that work, we had the perspective of we don't have enough information in order to fly these spacecraft safely. And it was, and it was uh, frustrating all the time where we had, um, uh, for example, working at, the, um, at Point Magoo with the Navy on their geocommunications uh, birds and getting conjunction warnings from the JSPOC and really not having um, the insight that that meant to, to know what we needed to do operationally. So we started doing kind of crazy things like figuring out what the phone number was of the guy who had the slot next to us and giving him a call and say, by the way, are you going to maneuver on Sunday like you normally do? And uh, a lot, we'd get answers back saying, um, yeah, it's the holiday weekend. I think we'll do it Monday. So we knew to whether or not if we, you know, what, what, if we needed to move or not. And the, the, the decisions that we made were not just based on the information we were getting from, from the JSPOC, but it was pattern of life, it was communications, and a large part of it was trust. Trusting the guy next to us that he knew what he was doing and that we could communicate with him and establish a relationship that allowed us to fly these satellites more safely. <clears throat> and I think that that is something that we need to take a look at in any system that we build and any endeavors we have, I think we, George laid out a number of fantastic things. And one thing that you have to overlay over that entire slide is trust. Um, that we have, to, we have to learn how to trust the data, the data we collect, and make that usable. We need to figure out how we can communicate and trust each other in the process. Um, that commercial operators who put data in a system have to know that um, the data it will be used for safety in, a, in an appropriate way, but nothing that would hurt them that would have, uh, say, negative ramification, ramifications financially or, you know, about the status of their, of their uh, constellation. Um, and the one thing about trust is it creates speed. Uh, organizationally, we see this, and it's, it's, it's great to experience it with an L3, but I think we all can, uh, can um, connect with this 
And that is, is that when you work in an environment where you're doing decision making or you're, you're collaborating either scientifically or making management decisions, or even in your family uh, setting, that things move along so much more quickly when you're working in a trusted environment, where naturally the, um, the, what, you're, what you're learning, you, uh, you understand it innately, you can trust it, you don't slow down to get more data or um, become uncertain about what that data really means. That the, that the establishing the level of trust allows you to move quickly and decisively. And so that's a foundation that we need to have as we move into an STM environment that I think is at a national and as a international level. So I think we need to consider that and we need to not overlay that in whatever we decide to do, both organizationally and technically, but we have to bake it in from the very beginning. Um, so that, that's really important. I, uh, uh, our, our organization, we've, we've done a lot of um, non-governmental SSA. So we talk about commercial SSA and, and space traffic management. Um, in today's era, in and around the Air Force programs, they refer to it, uh, they change their lexicon, and they call it non-governmental SSA. Uh, really what that means is commercial or institutional, or those things that don't come from the space surveillance network or from a national system. Uh, the, the, the biggest of those projects is at the National Space Defense Center, and it's going quite well, and where the government decides to go with that long term and and how that evolves is, is um, to be determined. But today, there, um, on a regular basis, there is, non, there is unclassified aggregation of optical and radar when they buy it. They need to buy more. Our passive RF, when they buy it, they need to buy more. But about, depending on the day, anywhere between 800,000 and uh, 1.2 million observations aggregated uh, run through data conditioning, uh, quality metrics associated with that, and then put into, a, via an unclassified line, onto the floor of the NSDC. And what do we see as an effect of that? We actually see the operators and the decision makers on the floor there come over to commercial first and say, what do you see? Why do they do that? Because they, cause we normally see things before the national system comes up with them. Now, that doesn't mean that they trust it as the definitive view, but it allows them to say, huh, interesting, let's go look over here, or let's go task that. So, um, so anyway, it's been a uh, successful project, and it includes um, multiple companies that are, in, you know, that are in this room. So I'm looking forward to more discussion, and I think I probably have used your time, that's, so that's thank you. That's why you yield. Thanks. Yes, that's right. <laughs> That's a great uh, perspective, Tom, and thanks for the flashback to speed up. <laughs> Our last panelist is uh, Vivek. He's uh, actually a fellow UT grad for the other uh, hook em horns in here. And so uh, Vivek's at Planet. You guys have all heard of Planet. You know what great and wonderful things they're doing right now, innovating and just pushing the state of the art and what we're doing in Earth imaging. And so he's going to have some interesting perspectives not only on that, but what the challenges are from a space traffic management and, and their interests. So I'll let you go ahead and do a little bit more introduction there, Vivek. Thanks, T.S. Um, yeah, so as T.S. said, I work at Planet, where I uh, lead our mission planning and scheduling efforts. And, um, and part of that is also our conjunction assessment and space traffic kind of internal management. Um, so Planet, if you don't know, is owns and operates the largest commercial constellation of satellites. We have three different kinds of satellites, in, all in uh, sun-synchronous low Earth orbit. Two of them, two of those types are around 100 kilograms and are maneuverable, called the Rapid Eye and the SkySats. And then over 100 of them are small 3U CubeSats that we call doves. Now, in terms of our efforts in the space traffic management, our main goal is to be as open and collaborative as possible with everything that we do. So before our launches, we talk to the JSPOC very closely. We talk to the Space Data Association, the TS. We work very closely, and we send kind of our launch manifests and um, any other info that we can get our hands on about the launch. And then once the satellites are in orbit, all our satellites are trackable, so they have not only um, 
ground station ranging from the Earth, but also GPS on board all of our satellites. So we do our own orbit determination in-house and we upload all this onto our website so that anyone can access our ephemeris to you know, as much accuracy as we know it ourselves. But then on top of that, we also share the ephemeris with other companies and organizations like the Space Data Association, we share it with Mariba, um, we share it with Leo Labs, um, and also SpaceNav. So, and then in case any other company or operator wants to know where our satellites are, we're always open to working with them closely, giving measurements if required, but at least the ephemeris. Yeah, and then um, other than the tracking part, we try to stick to all the guidelines that are already out there for you know the orbital lifetime, et cetera, and hope to continue sticking to the new ones as they come up. And other than that, I am really excited to be here and uh, take part in the AIAA working group tomorrow and you know make sure that Planet is represented and takes part in the discussions from the very beginning. So thank you. And uh, I have to say that working with Planet in uh, the Space Data Center, that they're actually like one of the, the operators that we think are doing things right. I and mean, we, we face these challenges like when we do these multi-payload launches where we're trying to do identification and the transparency that they have and, and the willingness to share the data they have makes the process for us to be able to identify which objects are which, you know, in the public catalog. And probably our biggest frustration is then actually getting 18th to take what we tell them and, and put it in there. But we've got operators like Planet or SES that are really kind of pushing the willingness to share and collaborate and work together to do this in the right way. And I have to commend Planet for what they're doing, particularly you say the largest commercial constellation. As far as I know, it's the largest constellation period. You've got over 200 satellites up there in orbit every day, and it's a challenge. And um, I think we're learning things about, you know, how to operate in that environment in, in preparation or in advance of what we're talking about for these large constellations that are supposedly getting ready to deploy soon. In fact, we've got OneWeb's launching their uh, first prototype satellites uh, sometime this afternoon. It's supposed to be at uh, 3.37 uh, Central Time, so we'll try to keep you up on that. You have fingers crossed, right? We'll see how that goes. Okay, so we did, did the introductions. You can kind of see that we've got this broad spectrum of, of people up here treating different parts of the problem. This is important. I, I think, George, you really hit the uh, topic on the head there with uh, you know, what we need to do, who needs to play, and, and everything. And so now what I want to do is I'm going to ask them you know, a couple questions, get them started. We'll, we'll take some time after each of the panelists had a chance to you know, answer to ask if anybody in the audience has any questions or comments, and then we'll go on to the next one. But so the, the first one I want to ask, and we'll just kind of go down the line and do that, is so if, as you look at uh, the issues that face us today for space traffic management, and so we're, we're not going softball here. They've already all been given homework. It's like, here's what we're going to talk about. So, you know, it, it may be a tough question, but they've had some time to think about it, and I expect that they'll have some good answers. But if you had, um, if it was up to you, what would you think the, fir the top two or three items might be that we need to address to kind of get the, the ball rolling on what we need to do for space traffic management? No pressure, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, T.S. So, uh, and again, I'll go back to, to George's excellent uh, keynote this morning and say, uh, I'll ask the question, what will it take to get people to actually do something? There are about, by my, by my analysis, about 30 to 50 international and domestic organizations, whether it's universities, whether it's uh, advisory councils, whether it's um, government organizations, whether it's just interest groups and industry groups, 30 to 50 organizations around the world who are looking at the issue of responsible space activity. That's a lot of people doing the same thing. So my question is, what will it take to actually get results? You know, if you look back at the aviation world, uh, the, the major changes in aviation, the major regulatory changes, 
I don't mean to use the R word, you know, in this, in this um, um, form, but the, it, it, what the, the main things that, that affected regulation in the aviation world were accidents, were catastrophic accidents. It may take that to get people to say, oh, I guess we really do have to do this. But I think having 30 to 50 organizations who are all working really hard, and there are a lot of people who are on multiple organizations doing this, the, looking at responsible space activity, a lot of people are working at this. It move, it's moving at a fairly uh, uh, lethargic pace, even though there's a lot of interest. But I guess my question is, what will it take? What will be the motivation for actually saying, OK, now it's time to do something? Will it be a massive collision between two spent Russian rocket bodies that doubles the catalog population? Will it be taking out a, a major communications satellite or something like that? But you know, in the human nature is such that it, it, people react when there is a, uh, a crisis. So it will be nice to think that people will, will do the right thing and come up with guidelines and come up with best practices and come up with standards and even regulations if that's what's required. Um, but I do worry that it is going to take some sort of a, a catastrophic activity. N another point to make, again, referring back to, to George's um, presentation, he was talking about the, I don't remember which of the bills it was, I think the House bill that had uh, $20 million per year for STM. That's great. The, as I recall, George, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the entire budget for AST every year was less than $20 million for the entire uh, commercial space transportation office at the FAA. Gee, it would be great to have $20 million a year for STM. Um, let's also throw some money at FAA to, to, to handle the the backlog of uh, the growing backlog of you know launch licensing and, and reentry licensing and just all the things that go around space activity to help smooth the process. People often talk about well, why don't the insurance companies just offer a discount? Mm, that's great, you know the the uh, um, uh, the, the Geico Gecko, you know, giving a good driver discount or something like that. That's a great idea, but it shouldn't take that to make people do the right thing. We're happy to give a discount when appropriate. And you know what, as, as I've often said, we'll be happy to give a discount until the activity that we're giving a discount for becomes the norm, and then it'll be a surcharge if you don't do it. So when I was young, seatbelts were actually an option that you could pay extra for in cars. You could actually pay extra and get seatbelts in your car. Well, now that look, sounds pretty funny to us today, but it was true. Of course, it's flipped around. And now, if you, probably, if you took the seatbelts out of your car, your insurance rates would skyrocket. So um, what are the two or three things? Find the motivation. Uh, that, that's key. Get, you know, what's it going to take to really get the community to take action as opposed to simply talking about it and coming up with great ideas? What's it really going to take? And then how do we build in a, a program of incentives to get people to do the right thing, even, uh, even if it's after a, some sort of crisis. So sometimes I look at the, the problem from uh, the lens of a simple army perspective. You guys are a little hoity, you know, you're three syllable, four syllable Air Force guys. So you think, you know, the, the big problem, I'm a two syllable guy. Um, so from the army, what, what do you do? You, you define what the mission is. What is my mission? And then you work backwards from there. And how do you accomplish that mission? I think it's critical for us to define what the mission is, what we're trying to accomplish. And it seems pretty easy. You know, space traffic management, safe operations, and this, you know, all, all that seems ideal. Put that down there. How do we achieve this? How do we achieve it through um, funding, as, as we said, you know, the $20 million, the fight. I remember the fight just to, you know, what we work in, just get AST another million dollars so they can add just a few more heads in the office to, to, to handle the, the um, tremendous amount of workflow. Everyone's cheering and applauding that, you know, we're, you know, for, uh, we're shooting for 40 launches. And, and it's like, you know, we, we don't, don't have enough people for the, the, the 18 or 20 that they were doing for the licensing and the spaceports and all the additional duties. So you have to, you know, um, responsibly fund this endeavor. What you, when you define what the endeavor is, how are we going to responsibly fund this? And we have to look at other pockets of money. You know, the FAA, they're tapped out, but then you look at DOD spending on a lot of this, 
and, and, and not just STM, but it's just the out of control spending that is there, and in some cases, even NASA and how they're spending it. And, and some of the, these, these clamps need to put down, be put down on some of these uh, excessive spending and, and focus it on the tension where it's really critical. I think STM is a critical, um, uh, of critical importance right now to the industry. And we have to, you know, articulate that through budgetary processes. Um, I think that the collaboration is another huge thing on bringing people together, all the, identifying what tools are available. I think that's that's uh, imperative, so we don't go out reinventing the wheel to, you know, try to create a problem with with new tools. Uh, I think there's great existing tools on the marketplace, and I think working together uh, with different industries. And and Tom brought up something. Uh, that it might be out of the, the, the two that we're supposed to identify, but the trust, the trust issue on, on how are we doing, not just amongst ourselves, not just industry working with government, but how are we looking at this internationally? I think it's perfect that, you know, the, um, for the working group that you have tomorrow, that the idea is to present this at the IAC, because I know, and I know we have some uh, representatives from DLR here, I, I know a lot of the, the international space agencies are looking at this problem. And how receptive are we as a nation to hearing the concerns of the, the other nations and from a global perspective? And I think we really need to, to tune into that a little bit better. So, and that too. So I have to say, Eric, that I must have hung with you Army guys too much because I'm all about the strategy to task and clearly defined objectives, measurable, you know, all that. And I think that's an important part of what we need to do here. I mean, if you don't, you know from being in the Army, if you don't know what the mission is, where your, what your objectives are, you're not going to accomplish them. And we need to do the same thing in SDM. All right, Tom? Big tent. Yes. What's that? We're big tent people. Bring right, it, right. Bring you Air Force people in. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start by putting it in a uh, sports analogy. It seems like in and around STM and uh, um, non uh, SSA, STM outside of the Air Force, and I suppose maybe even in, include the government agencies, this seems like a kid's soccer game. Everyone's chasing the ball, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the ball is around the field, the kids are chasing it around the field, and it's, it's unstructured. And, yeah, we generally know that there's a goal. Uh, there's actually goals at two ends of the field, and we're hoping that the kids not get in the right goal. And and we don't know when they're going to get there, and uh, but we know that they're they're using a lot of energy, running around, having fun doing it. I suppose. Um, it seems to me that that we need to maybe look at different a different analogy, and maybe it's a football one where we need a quarterback. We need someone who directs the activity in a way that that. Um, and hopefully quarterbacks do this, and that is move the team down the field to uh, win the game, score it, and, 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 and win the game. Um, and that person is, uh, uh, it would be a leader. Uh, so w how can something like that occur, and are there models for that in the past? Uh, I frequently look at this industry, or our, uh, uh, what we're doing here, and um, think back to the geointelligence marketplace and geointelligence industry, which also grew out of a government fu function that had um, a lot of innovation coming to it, that had uh, commercial participation, had a need for data sharing, had a need, had a, had a need for globalization, um, and um, had a, it, it's a lot of the similar things associated with space traffic management. What, what um, has worked well in, in that environment, I believe, is the fact that there was an executive order, and it was Executive Order 12333, that established the, established the role of a functional manager and designated geointelligence as a, a functional management discipline. So uh, that effectively elevated it up uh, uh, higher than the different organizations and the different agencies. And um, what did that functional manager for geointelligence do? He, over, um, he oversaw and guides the discipline and the enterprise of the, it, um, uh, above the individual organizations uh, in the capacity to what? Um, be the principal advisor, um, be the leader of the GEOINT community, and, and uh, provide a framework for collaboration, coordination, and support to enhance decision makers and the consumer's ability to perform their missions. So it's mission orientation. That's really what, you know, that's what we need to be thinking about is mission. How do we make 
uh, what we do here, how do we allow commercial and national actors to perform their missions and do it safely? Um, and the other thing that the functional manager does is he's the integrator of the GeoInt enterprise, uh, developing plans, policies, programs, architectures, and standards that unify the efforts and optimize the resources within what's called the NSG, or the National System for Geospatial. Now, the, um, what they decided to do was assign that responsibility to the head of the NGA, so that was Robert Cardello, and uh, that goes back to uh, Jim Clapper, and I think Clapper was uh, instrumental in how some of this came together. But I think that, that we need to look at who's going to be our quarterback, and do we need to bring it above this fray of transportation or commerce or NASA or other organizations? And do we need to elevate this such that it, it may be able to have a, uh, um, a direct reporting as a, as a national function? Uh, I think that the, that function could be, um, uh, you could refer to that as a national space safety function, right? Um, and so um, the other thing about that is, is that that might be nice to have a, have a, ha assign a quarterback or have a, put a, uh, a, an organization together. But if you don't resource them, they're not going to get anywhere. Um, and we've touched on this, this, this thing of, of resources and money and, you know, and if we're, if we're talking about adding a million onto a 20, we're, that's the wrong discussion. I think we need to take a look at, well, who are, the, who are the primary beneficiaries and who are the users and where's the money in the, in, in the space business? And if you take a look at all the reports that are published, it's in the, the, the subscriber area. Uh, it's not those who make the satellites or do the launch or do uh, these other things that make the money. It's actually the guys here with the, the direct TVs, the broadband providers. It's the people that have the subscriber services or use things like um, GPS that, that actually um, uh, make up, I think, probably over 80% of the revenue that, that comes into our industry. So how do we effectively use that deep pool um, and the resources of those users in order to position um, a national um, space safety strategy that is, um, I think, uh, part funded by that deep pool of resources. Um, if you can make the argument uh, to those subscribers that the loss of their banking, the loss of all these services that they come to rely on that we know space provides would be catastrophic for them, possibly they would get on board with the fact that a little bit on every bill is not too large of a price to pay. But I think that we need to get clear in terms of leadership, and I think we need to get clear in, in terms of sustainable funding, and that funding needs to um, uh, be at a level that um, is going to be able to get the job done. More, right. to, more, mm -hmm. to, more to follow. <laughs> all right, more to follow. Vivek? All right, thanks. Yeah, so these have all been great points. I guess my answer is a lot shorter and uh, narrower scope. I think for us, we're, you know, as I mentioned before, we're very open about our data and everything, and we're kind of ready for a place to put it all in. And there are some places where we share these with, but what we're really excited about is to have kind of a place where not just everyone can go and look, but they actually go and look for the data um, and everything there. And then the second part is, I think, what you mentioned about trust. That seems very important. It's like, you know, we know and trust our data and our methods, but how can we know and trust other people's methods? And, um, and what would be great is in this kind of open methodology, if people can also share algorithms and the way decision making thresholds, all these kind of small nuances that actually end up affecting a lot um, operationally. And then um, I guess the final point is very low Earth orbit specific is that, um, and this was also mentioned in talks yesterday, was that we need better atmosphere models since that's kind of the things that gives us the most trouble and heartache. So <laughs> that's something we'd be really excited to see improve. Okay. Mark. Make, and so if you have questions, uh, 
how you can come down and use the mic or <coughs> just speak loudly, but. Yeah, I don't think you should give up on that. Those are great comments, Mark. And in fact, uh, you're paying attention to the point that you're anticipating our next question for the panel, which uh, we'll get to in a minute. But go ahead, uh, Mariba. Yeah, I guess uh, just some things based on the stuff that you guys uh, spoke about. And it just made me think, and maybe it's something that, that you folks can comment, certainly for everybody in the room here. But, um, you know, one of the things that you brought up uh, Chris, is you said, okay, well, um, embracing risk, right? And, and, and that people should think about that and, and think about insurance, about, you know, embracing risk and that sort of stuff. I've got to say, um, that's not for space. Some things are very clear cut as far as risky. Others are very nebulous. What I'm saying is that there's still a lot of science that is 
left to be done to really quantify that risk in a way that everybody agrees, yes, this is repeatable, it's quantifiable, this is what risk is. So there's still some science that needs to be done, I think, to really understand you know, effects and impacts of space environment on operations, all these different things. Um, the second thing uh, you know, for the panel here is that um, you brought up trust. Uh, trust is an interesting word. You talked about, okay, you get on the phone and are you going to maneuver today? Well, it's a holiday. I'm going to do it on Monday, that sort of thing. That sounds kind of cool, and it would be nice to envision getting to a world where everybody's doing that. But when I hear trust, foundationally, I think predictability. You want to be able to predict what somebody else is going to do. You may not be their best friend. You may not know their kids and, and have wine you know, at night with them. But if you can predict what they're going to do at any given time, that's what's going to get us to, to safety. And so when it comes to that predictability, the thing that I still don't hear and I would love for people to start focusing on more is the cultural competency. I get on, you know, a lot of people here travel overseas. I'm one of them. When I go to Germany, I don't need a German driver's license. I can rent a car and I can get on the Autobahn. Guess what? One of the first things that, that I experienced in Germany when I first went, don't go into the left lane slow. <laughs> All right? Don't do that, because you're going to feel photon pressure on the back of your neck. And when you look in your rearview mirror, you're going to see somebody staring very angrily at you. But in general, the rules of the road are similar, but there's a cultural difference, okay, based on where you go. There's cultural differences in space. I wonder how many people are here that might be operating Israeli satellites. Do the Israelis maneuver or do ops on Shabbat? I don't know. How would Sharia interpret the UN copious guidelines, for instance? These are things that if we don't start unraveling the cultural piece, we're just fooling ourselves thinking that we're just going to get over this with data and measurements and physics. There's human aspects that, that need to be uh, involved in this sort of stuff. And you said motivate. How do you motivate good behavior? There's 30 people looking at that, right? Um, I would say, well, here's, here's EXO in the room. They, they have some beautiful video that you can go check out, you know, Telcom 1, MC9. That's one person's opinion about something that happened. How many other people in the room have opinions? So what I'm saying is that if things can't be corroborated, you're not going to motivate people to do stuff unless there's corroboration, unless there's ubiquitous evidence where from that same pool of evidence, Everybody is saying, yeah, these people did that because I saw it. No, oh, I saw it too. I saw it too. I saw it too. If it's just one person, then we can't get out of this he said, she said kind of thing. So anyway, I wanted to just put that out there. All right. All right thanks, Mariva. Anybody else? Any questions for the panel? Brian? Right, so the, the next accident is going to wait for us to be ready. So we've got to get our act together.
I, I worked with, uh, with TS for, for many years when I was at AGI. And, um, and so I've, working with the Air Force and on the JMS program and seeing these timelines, I just finished up the therapy uh, a few, <laughs> few months ago. It, 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 was, it was painful, and especially you know, putting yourself in, in the commercial world um, and that one of, the, one of the catchphrases that we're trying to push you know, with, with, within the government um, as we talk to these, these uh, the leaders and decision makers is the speed of industry. Government really has to embrace the idea of working at the speed of industry. We're seeing this. Uh, th this has been embraced with some of these space policy directives on um, reforming these regulations, on uh, um, implementing new tools, existing tools that are out there for uh, airspace integration. We see this. I have been um, very upbeat uh, of the, the role General Hyten uh, has taken at STRATCOM. Uh, I've worked with him and his staff now uh, on three different, uh, for lack of a better term, field trips uh, where we've gone out to places like Seattle, Boston, and just recently out to Silicon Valley. Um, and what he is trying to do is, is say, how can the commercial sector help me? Because I've got, I got today problems that I need a today answer for. I don't need it you know, down, down the road at 2023. And we really have to you know, constantly educate uh, folks in the government, and, the, and they're, I'm not disparaging at all because they're doing fantastic work um, with what they have, and and I think sometimes they just have to get out and get in their lane. I've been working with um, uh, ODNI on this idea of externships because you have some of the most brilliant people locked in the room, you know, in in McLean doing all these these fantastic things, but they don't know the other tools that are out there. They don't know what Leo Labs is doing or, you know, the, the, the different, you know, uh, for, for Planet. You know, for, I think we got General Hyten out to the Planet a few weeks ago, and, and he was in awe of what they're doing. And just to, you know, really de delve into this. So, you know, this idea of these externships, we're getting these, these analysts and people that are operating, you know, to see what kind of tools are out there um, so we can enhance this, this timeline of, you know, because 2023, you know, make, you know, who knows where they're going to be. In 2023, the, the, the rapidity of how things are changing is amazing. Yeah, so I, I think that um, instead of, uh, I, I think the government needs to come out with a, but what they see is their concept of operations for an integrated STM and the role of that that commercial can play. Um, is Leo Labs or L3 or EXO? Are we doing the right things? Uh, are we so as data providers or? providing analysis or decision support in different levels that we can provide. Um, who's going to provide the warning services and who actually is going to be responsible for actually telling someone what, what they need to know um, for safe flight operations and to support both regula uh, the, the regulatory side at the beginning and maybe the forensic side at, at the back end, right? But what is the, con what the government, instead of looking around and saying, what is it, what is it, I think the government needs to, needs to sit down and in systems engineering, they call it an OV1 or an overview one slide. They need to come and, cut it and look at what is my concept of operations, how do I write that down, how do I verbalize that or graphically depict it so I can show someone and say, hey, this is my role, this is your role, this is where to invest. And by the way, don't bother doing that because I view I need to do that in the future because that's my job. And I think that that needs to be decided on and established because that, because that will help enable investment in the private industry to go fill in where their, their lanes are defined within that concept of operation. Uh, I think then, again, it gets back to funding in terms of focus funding then on where you want the commercial industry to participate within that, within that CONOP. I'm, I'm just disappointed that I, I'm sensing that as a, as someone who is directing an IRAD budget, where do we put that money and are we putting it in the right spots and how do we, how do we verify that? So uh, these bets that are un very uncertain at this point in time because of a lack of funding commitment, am I even making, if, if I'm willing to go ahead and take those risks, I actually even doing it in the right lane. So, you know, help identify that for us. Please identify a, um, uh, a, your, your concept of operations that you want us to buy into. 
that's a, that's a great point. Just to tag on to that, it's an excellent point. Investors want to know some some level of certainty. They want to know if they're going to be putting in money. They want to know, understand the market that it's going to serve uh, with the small sats and the small launch vehicles. They see that it's a clear market that they're seeing. There's a need. Uh, the, the, this, this explosive growth in the small satellite, how are we going to get them up there affordably? They invest in launch companies. I think if you don't have that direction and that leadership from the government to say, this is what we need, these are the tools that we're going to need for, for STM, uh, I think there's a hesitation in the investment. Right. So. Absolutely. Ed. Ed. Let me ask a question, um, and that is, so um, you're VC funded right now, uh, partially right now, uh, completely. completely. VCs want to see a, uh, a number one investor to, that, that leads the round, right? And then the others, you know, they help set the valuation, they help uh, uh, you know, get, the, uh, get the investment going uh, on many levels. I still think that, 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 that the government hasn't fulfilled that within uh, the, the STM arena, and I think how they can do that um, is in foundational data. Uh, I'll go back to GeoWint. The thing that allowed the industry to now invest at the analytics level and the services level is that the government committed in the early 2000s to something called enhanced view, which, which was um, you know, multiple billions of dollars of data purchases and infrastructure purchases from the competitive providers out there that met the requirements for data quality and, inter, uh, and security and service levels. Um, and um, uh, the NGA formed a partnership with them 
such that the NGA even had representatives from their organizations sitting in the data provider's footprint telling them what they needed to know how to be a better service provider and formed a partnership with them. Um, in the front hall of Digital Glow over GOI, you had the NGA rep. And the NGA rep was there every, every day with them, um, improving their service levels and, and supporting mission knowledge with them. Um, and it bought enough data in order to fund the constellations that are in place that then allowed the investment at the analytical level and the derived services level to, to occur. Um, I think that the U.S. government needs to figure out how to do an enhanced view for space safety, and, um, and it should have an infrastructure and a quality and a service level component. And uh, I think we need to focus it on U.S. providers, and I think that they need to go out and buy enough foundational data to let the EXOs and the LEO labs and the Numericas and the L L3 ADSs and the other companies to go ahead and, and bring in the rest of the investment and go ahead and build a, a, a capability that then that, that can move this forward. Um, so that's a specific recommendation. We have to look at what is what's an enhanced view program look like for space or safety. Yeah. Vivek or Chris, do you have any comments on that? <clears throat> you know, uh, I'm going to come back to Mariba's comment and sort of wrap it into the, the whole discussion. You were talking about. Uh, this notion of embracing, you know, my comment about embracing risk. Risk is not um, something you can completely get rid of. There's a, there's a fundamental um, principle in insurance that what we, sh we, what we insure against isn't the stuff we know, it's the stuff we don't know. It's fortuity, okay? Fortuity is one of the foundational elements of insurance. If a launch vehicle fails, they fix it, we ensure the next one. We know that that same thing could happen again, but what's more likely to happen is the thing that we haven't even thought of. So it's great to try and wrap our hands around, wrap our heads, wrap our groups around all the things we can imagine, but that's a tiny subset of all the things that might happen. So the work is good and it's important, um, but we have to recognize that risk is there. I mean, personally, without risk, I don't have a job, so I, I, I kind of <laughs> like risk. I embrace risk. Um, but, the, um, uh, but the point is we need to keep doing this work. We need to keep on uh, talking, keep on working on it, keep on playing the war games, trying to figure out what, uh, what the outcomes might be, but also remembering that it's those unknowns that we just cannot even imagine. That, I mean, the things that I've seen in my 35 years in space insurance, the, the crazy, silly things that people have done with satellites and launch vehicles, uh, you, you know, they, they would make a great story. Um, so let's try to mitigate what we can get our arms around, but let's not worry about the fact that there's a lot that might happen that we can't even imagine. So. See the, the New York uh, version, the insurance version of Gordon Gecko. <laughs> Risk is good. Risk is good. I thought I saw a question back here somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think the not willing to share pretty much comes down to will it affect our business? You know, is it off business value? For us, in our case, you know, we saw imagery, we saw kind of decisions based on that, the analytics for that. So where our satellites are, how we do our redetermination, that's not necessarily related to our business. So there's no reason for us to hide information like that. So I think, and probably for, you know, I can't speak for other operators, but I, I feel like they all kind of subscribe to the same mentality, where if it doesn't affect what we sell, we can be completely open about it. Um, the reasons they might not be open about it maybe come down to, comes down to the people perhaps that are working there. They might be used to not sharing data and so continue along that path, you know. So that's, yeah. It's kind of my share. And actually, that's what we do in the Space Data Center. I mean, it's, you know, the development of that just quickly was one of those where people didn't want to share their data initially. It's like, well, we're competitors. You're going to figure out what I'm doing or where I'm moving to or whatever. And the notion was nobody was going to want to share their data on where's their satellite, when are they maneuvering, that kind of stuff. And we just asked them. And in fact, when we set up the prototype, I was faced with the, cho the choice of, should I set it up so that each operator could approve who could or couldn't see their data, which would be a giant pain in the rear, or would I just say, hey, everybody's going to see everybody else's data? And that's what I decided. I was lazy. I told them that's what we're going to do. And we operated for years in that prototype system, and nobody once ever complained about sharing their data with everybody else in the system. And we had Arabs and Israelis and, I mean, anything you can imagine in terms of competing interest, however you want to define that. So it's, it's possible to tell them and get them moving in that direction. Ed? An example, two, uh, two, two times we've seen data sharing um, with, with restrictions. Uh, not to, I'm not going to name the company's names, but we were involved in a controlled uh, deorbit of a satellite. Uh, the, the satellite had not been operational in terms of um, uh, uh, generating revenue for over a year, but they were good stewards and, and took it, they um, had us take it down. Um, we could not issue a press release or anything about our work with them until after their financial results were posted at the end of that quarter. Because even though it wasn't generating revenue, they didn't want anyone on Wall Street to misinterpret the fact that they just lost a satellite, right? So, um, and there, another case, and I think Ed's company helped us a little bit on this, there was another low Earth orbiting satellite that had a, a little um, hitch with a piece of debris going through a solar panel its uh, orbital elements had changed, and we saw that and said, huh, what happened here? And um, 
the, a small piece of debris and the radar cross section of one of the solar panels changed. And so, so you know, we did some analysis with them. And um, again, the fact that that may imply an uh, implication on revenue uh, for the company, uh, the, uh, our ability to communicate and talk about that in the open was severely limited. So a lot of it goes back to straight financial, Wall Street, uh, either uh, uh, specific reasons or fear-based reasons, right, of, of things in misinterpreting what's going on with, with your space assets. Absolutely, yes, they are. But how do you separate the one from the other? Yeah. Mark, go ahead, Mark. Well, free to everybody except the U.S. taxpayers, right? <laughs> yeah. Brian, real quick. Dan? Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. I've been going to SSJ and now SGM meetings for a long time. And one of the things I've observed is that we, our perspectives and our experience and the orbit regimes we work in tend to color what we bring to these meetings. A lot of times to the exclusion of other regimes. The comments about the percentage of debris versus ashes Real, totally agree. Real, totally different story. If you look at the accuracy of the, the current uh, base box product, and we just have a publication this week at the International Space Symposium for Cybernetics, we were allowed graciously by the Crash House to, to uh, include statistics on performance. And what's beautiful thing is, 
So I have to say this has been great discussion. We've got 10 minutes left, and so I'm going to throw the next question out to the panel, but I want the rest of you to think about this. Hopefully a lot of you will participate in what we're going to do with AAA tomorrow. And the question is, so we talked about what do you think is important, what would you do, but the question that uh, Mark raised, which is, okay, so you have to start somewhere, right? So maybe what you think is the most important isn't necessarily the first thing you do. And we've got to get this ball rolling. So, you know, for any of you who want to take it, uh, if you had the choice, where would you start on what we have to do to move forward? Maybe ask the question, uh, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Okay, what's the problem we're trying to solve? The problem we're trying to solve may be we want to avoid collisions in general, whether it's active on active or debris on debris or whatever. You, we want to avoid collisions. So is that, is that the starting point? Um, working backwards from there, um, uh, do we, <clears throat> do we uh, remove objects? Do we um, move them out of the way? Do we uh, have more control on objects? There are a lot of options for um, solving that issue, but let's first decide what the problem is. To me, the problem is the collision risk, okay? The risk of collision between any two objects up there because that affects my world, my risk profile. Um, the, you know, we've seen a lot of studies on where is the problem really? Is the problem with active on active collisions? Is it, uh, you know, an iridium satellite hitting another iridium satellite because they lose control of it or something? Probably not. That's a tiny, that's a tiny part of it. Um, one of the studies I was looking at recently talked about lethal non-trackable objects and, and, and um, the metric that they had was that 97 percent of the collision risk is from lethal non-trackable, meaning less than, say, 10 centimeters down to maybe one centimeter objects, small objects that just can't be tracked. I may have the metrics wrong, but in general, um, how do we, one, clean that up, and two, how do we avoid making more of those? So again, there are ways to do that, but let's first ask the question, what do we, what's the outcome we want? Where do we want to end up? Um, and I will just throw in there, you know, there was a great video online from about a week ago of an experiment uh, by the company Remove Debris of uh, uh, where they shot a harpoon at a target, okay? Can I just say, let's not have harpoons in space. <laughs> harpoons in space can't do any good, okay? You know, it may look cool, but it's just going to make the problem bigger. That's just my little uh, anti-pitch. I think that was harpoons. a bunch of engineers going nuts with the money. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> preferring laser beams. Laser beams. Starts with laser beams. Uh, I, I think you, you, Chris is off, you know, on the mark. I think you've got to identify what the problem is, what, what's the objective you want to accomplish. Um, what tools are available, what kind of funding is going to be required, and where is the leadership going to come from? I, I, I like Tom's analogy on, on the, the quarterback, um, but as we also, um, maybe it was Mark that said it from an international perspective, um, you, 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 got, you got to pay the quarterback. You know, leadership, if, if the U.S. wants to be the leader and we move forward, the, they need to step up financially, you know, on the funding on this. Uh, and I think others will, will fall in um, if, if we do provide that leadership. So um, I, I think you've got to you know, put it in some buckets and, you know, the, the data lake. I, I love that idea of, of all the um, aspects that we have. But um, leadership, define the problem, uh, understand what tools are available, and then execute. 
Thank you. I agree with all that. I think uh, pragmatically, I would follow through with the with the test bed and uh, establish that if it's if it's going to be in DOC or where. But we need the test bed. I think we need to seed that test bed with a sufficient amount of data in order to do um, uh, development and and. Uh, uh, I, th I think we need to engage the science and technology community and, and commercial industry in there on that test bed in a, in a way that will be productive such that we're being pragmatic about supporting operators and operational needs all the way back to identifying and filling the S&T gaps in and around that. So, uh, um, yeah. Vivek? Um, yeah, I also love the analogy of the leadership. I think that would be Great to have, like, you know, we want to be a good and responsible actor in space, and it would be nice to follow certain guidelines and things set by someone in a leadership position. And um, yeah, and we want to be a good actor, not just for our current missions, but our future missions, and also for everyone's sake. So just want to keep everything safe. So I think we're running to the end of our time, but I want to say, we had a great panel here. Can we get some applause for them?